Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Bucky, uh, Bucky Comprehensivity to Understand and Change the World. And we'll, we're with Kurt McNamara, who's gracious enough to join us each month uh, and helps relay Bucky's concepts. And tonight we'll be covering one of the most important concepts I feel uh, that Bucky has uh, come up with, and that is the idea of trim tab. So with that, uh, we'll have uh, um, a presentation by Kurt. He, he'll open it up for questions as we go along, and then uh, we'll have some a dialogue at the end. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to Kurt. Hi, everybody. Uh, let's see if this works. Try again. Full screen. Yep. All right. Yeah, very pleased to see you all here. And um, uh, just to echo Joe's point is the idea of trim tab has attracted many people to Bucky and it's very powerful as well as being <laughs> very attractive, I guess. So we like to uh, put it a little bit in context one of the reasons why Bucky is so intriguing to people, well, there's a baby, well, there's several reasons. Um, <clears throat> one is there, there are a number of people interested in systems change and Bucky's associated with these deep insights and in system change. And then of course, there's people interested in the artifacts like the geodesic domes and that. And then of course, there's people that are interested in the uh, synergetics approach to geometry uh, their operational mathematics, you know, working with what is rather than abstract concepts to start with. So on the systems change perspective, um, we've got what we're talking about tonight, which is essentially changing the direction. And so you have some kind of a system in motion and you want to affect change on that. Uh, all systems are in motion. <laughs> so it turns out that if you want to change the direction of any system, trim tab are probably worthwhile. And then there's another one, which we won't talk about tonight, which he called procession, which is essentially the sort of unintentional effects of one system on another. That's an example of systems coupling. Now, of course, uh, I think uh, Jeannie would tell you as well that trim tab is also a systems coupling or a processional effect. And the most famous example Bucky gave us is that when the pollinator enters the flower, it doesn't intend to pick up pollen. I mean, in some cases it does because it feeds on pollen, but mostly we think of them as collecting nectar. But however, you know, it picks it up kind of almost accidentally, right? And then it deposits that on the next. And so that may turn out though to be the biggest effect of the pollinator. And then there's another uh, related-ish, re related uh, topic or idea on systems coupling, just this idea of exchange between two systems. And then finally, um, Bucky is famous for saying, don't fight the existing system, creating the model. And that really means kind of a design approach uh, to come up with a new way of combining components together, typically in a network fashion, so that you can uh, come up with a solution uh, in a way that's more efficient than trying to sort of fight an existing system. So these are different things that Bucky did, and we're talking about just the trim tab one tonight. So this is an illustration from Synergetics on systems coupling. And this is his uh, physical example, if you will, that systems can couple at one point or node, that's the lower right, where you see the two tetrahedrons joined by a single uh, relation. And he said, this is more like molecules of gas. They could all, they could go in all different kinds of directions. They're very loosely coupled. And then if you go to the upper right, you see these two interconnections. And he said, this, you know, these two act more like a hinge. So this is then more like a liquid. <clears throat> so you're more closely bonded, but you can still have a, a fair amount of freedom of movement. And then finally, on the uh, uh, on the left is three points of contact. And when you have three points of contact, really, these two systems become one, at least one in terms of the overall system. They're probably still a separate or delineated, whatever the word is, internally. So this is his physical example of systems coupling. And really, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about one type of systems coupling uh, tonight. 
So this is Bucky's definition of trim tab, or at least explanation of trim tab from the Synergetics Dictionary. And the Synergetics Dictionary was developed by Bucky and Ed Applewhite uh, in preparation for creating the Synergetics volumes. And so what Ed did is he would type up whatever Bucky was saying that seemed to be important, uh, might be in a speech, might be something Bucky wrote down, might be in a previous book, and he, or he would organize those. And uh, so they were many thousands of entries. They were put together in a couple of big books that uh, are hard to get nowadays, but they were digitized by uh, R.W. Gray and put up online along with the two Synergetics volumes. So if you just Google Synergetics Dictionary, R.W. Gray, you'll get to it. It's not the easiest thing always to access because it's not searchable. It's just a bazillion cards uh, arranged by alphabetical uh, the first letter. So you would have to click on T and then and then bop around, you know, bop along, you know, 50 or 100 cards at a time until they came to trim tab. If you did that, and I recommend you do that because it's a really interesting way to get a, 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 a better perspective, I think, on what Bucky was saying, uh, you'll find this uh, his classic example of trim tab. And uh, so what is he saying? You know, he says, well, think about what a little person could do. So you've got the Queen Mary. So here's this huge ocean liner, right? The rudder on the Queen Mary is as big as my house. It's enormous. To try and move the rudder is really, really hard. So then really, I don't know, over 150 years ago, probably longer, people invented this idea of the trim tab, which is a little rudder on the edge of the rudder. And if you move this little rudder on the rudder, which is easy to move, right? Because it's a small thing. It creates a low pressure zone. Since it creates a low pressure zone, the big rudder wants to go there, right? There's lower pressure over there. I want to go that way. So then uh, that's really the trim tab effect. It's got a lot to do with leverage, right? You're able from the front of the boat, basically, because in 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 boats, you steer from the rear, right? Uh, the front of the boat is way up there. It might be several blocks away in a Queen Mary, right? And uh, I'm the rudder back here. And in fact, the trim tab's behind the rudder. So you steer from the rear and uh, with this leverage, right? And the lever itself, this trim tab, its effect is to create a low pressure zone that moves a much larger thing, the actual rudder, and then moves the entire boat. So Bucky really loved this idea because it seemed to be a metaphor for his life. If he went around and worked with people, you know, giving them ideas and better ways to do things, he would affect essentially change in those individuals and those individuals that go have changed designs that would change the world. So, uh, so anyway, there's numerous uh, points in this image uh, that basically speak to that whole thing. Society thinks it's going right by you that it's left you all together. But if you're doing dynamic stuff, the fact is you can just put your foot out and the whole big ship of state will move. Now, all right, we know that we can't all swim up alongside a ship and move the trim tab, right? We do know this. So then how does that actually work? Oh, but first I'm going to show you this picture. Um, so these are trim tabs on an airplane. And they're on uh, the the rudder of the airplane and the uh, control surfaces, they call them. And I think actually the flaps on the airplane wings are also trim tabs. In the case of an airplane, they say the most important thing is that once they put trim tabs on, the pilot could now control it. So if you imagine older planes, they didn't have these motors in between what we call now fly-by-wire. You were literally you know, moving the wires or the cables, I should say, that control the control surfaces with your hands. And so if you were in any kind of uh, turbulence or any kind of situation with a lot of forces, it was really hard to control the plane. But as soon as they added trim tabs, the trim tabs smoothed out the control because now you're just you know adjusting a little trim tab and that itself is adjusting a control surface. So they say the biggest effect of a trim tab in an airplane in many ways was to allow the pilot to fly it more easily. So uh, in this card, I developed some of these a couple of years ago uh, during National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo. I do NaNoWriMo not to write a novel, but have a goal to work on some aspect of a project every day. 
So I made up a whole bunch of cards. Not always, not, excuse me, all quite as good as this one, but this one, uh, uh, it, it it works. I, you know, you can tell that I got the illustration from somewhere. Okay. So what are the elements of a trim tab? Well, you've got some person, right? Uh, that's trying to make the change, right? And then you've got some other system, whether that's a person, an organization, a ship or whatever that you're changing. And then you've got the lever of the channel by which to affect the change. And then because a lever works via a pivot, you have to have this pivot point. And so if you look to the upper right on this picture, you can see I've very crudely said, it kind of looks like this fuzzy channel with the system, which could be the boat or the organization or even yourself on the lower right, the person doing the change on the upper left and sort of a pivot uh, in there. So I see a hand raised. So I'm going to pause to see what Jeannie has to say. I, I see that that line is wavy. Is that because you have to use a trim tab, you know, in a kind of uh, repetitive motion? That's a cool idea. I like that a lot. Uh, so I think I did it uh, consciously slash unconsciously because I viewed the channel uh, as potentially containing information, containing waves, right? That would be very Bucky-like to say it contained waves of information, basically. I think rarely do we get to actually physically, right, run the trim tab. We're mostly, when we're trim tabbing, I think we're metaphysically trying to change something with information. And then, yeah, I think that idea of some variation in it uh, is, is useful, I guess. So I haven't really worked through it, Jeannie, but uh, that's a good insight. I like that. Okay. Um, so let's see. I did a few more of these. Now this one uh, very simply shows the minimum system, the tetrahedron, and it's got the rudder, as you can see, in the lower, you know, the middle, lower part, and then it's got a little tiny trim tab on that. The point of this is just that for us to imagine ourselves like the Queen Mary, we have to kind of envision ourselves as a system, right? And then that we're moving in some kind of a flow. And whether that flow is physical, like I could actually be out canoeing, I guess, and I could be trim tabbing my canoe. But mostly when we're trim tabbing nowadays, we're talking metaphysically. So I should probably pause a moment. So uh, so in the basic Bucky, uh, uh, I don't know, the basics of Bucky, uh, he said the universe consists of two things, physical, all the things we see, right? All the Kurtz and genies and books and computers and all the design stuff. Uh, the animals, the grass, everything, okay. And those are all what he called special case. So everyone we look at is unique and different. It's all polyhedral. It's all connected together with laws of synergetics, but it's unique and different. But there are what he called generalized principles that govern how organisms come together, grow, uh, co-create, you know, reproduce, etc. And those sort of laws and principles he said were metaphysical which means they they're not actually a thing you can pick up and move around but they do tell you how things can be picked up and move around and combined and so then those are in a way well he called them metaphysical and so we would call them the laws of science we would call them you know the rules we learn of anthropology that sort of thing so that the universe is a combination of all the physical things we see, uh, and then the observation that they are the way they are because of these generalized principles, which are the metaphysical part of it. And so then I think that mostly when we're talking about trim tabs in our lives, we're talking about making a metaphysical change. The metaphysical change essentially will affect the physical universe, right? It will affect us, for example, in our behavior, our organization, but it's an idea which is expressed, uh, is thought of and expressed, uh, well, even ex expressed might be physical, but it's thought of and worked through, determined uh, in a metaphysical sense, and then tested in the physical world, I guess, to see that it actually works. So there's probably too many words and maybe a little confusing, but just to re-emphasize that um, many times the trim tab, the way we view it, 
is this generalized principle um, that has to do with how things come together rather than the specifics of a particular thing, if you will. So then uh, the point of this illustration is just to say that all of us are, are systems that are in some kind of a flow. We're all in some kind of a flow ourselves, some, which is they're basically metaphysical, you know, the flows, the forces and fields we find ourselves in. And we talked last time I was here about the fact that we're all orbiting other systems. And uh, so, for example, you know, I orbit the ideas of Bucky Fuller. I don't fall into Bucky, right? But I have a close attraction. I don't fly away from Bucky by saying I had enough. You know, I'm going to go off and study, you know, whoever now. And so the result of that is kind of a stable orbit. Or uh, my wife and I orbit each other, right? And we don't fall into each other entirely, but we don't fly away either. And we actually had a great question last time that, you know, were we taking the physical uh, properties of orbiting too far uh, when we suggested that metaphysical orbiting was a thing that, in, that impacted all of us? And a friend of mine uh, explained that, well, actually, if you look at H2O, you know, an oxygen, which is a big molecule, a uh, big atom, I guess, um, and hydrogen, which are small atoms. And it's together because I think what the oxygen has a couple extra electrons that get shared with the uh, uh, hydrogens. Said what actually happens is the, the electron goes spinning around the oxygen once, and then it goes around one of the hydrogens, and then it goes back around the oxygen, and then it goes around one of the hydrogens. And so actually, if we thought of, you know, like, you know, if you're in a relationship and you're also one of you is involved in a big system, it's that three body problem, right? So there's a big organization. And sometimes I might or orbit the organization, like when I had a teaching job, but I can't do it all the time because if I do, my wife will be very unhappy, right? But on the other hand, if I was just orbiting my wife, the organization would say, hey, wait a minute, Kurt, you're supposed to be teaching last night. So this is a nice way to express the metaphor a little more uh, concretely that, you know, in this orbiting, there typically are more than two things, two things or more. And, you know, we might view ourselves as the electron that's sometimes in orbit around one system and then around another. Okay. So it turns out that we're all just surrounded by other systems and they affect us, right? Like Bucky said, uh, precession, is the effect of one system on another and sort of the rule of the universe. That's how everything connects. So even though we're not uh, properly consciously aware of it, we're all in some forces or fields that are carrying us along, right? I have some expectations of how I am to be as a person as I'm aging and as I'm involved with church or school or whatever, right? Those are essentially forces and fields are kind of big systems way out there sort of carrying me along. And the, so the point of the yellow arrows is to just to say, we're all in forces or fields, we're all moving along and we all navigate. And so the navigation is deciding sort of where to go and what to do. But the way we move is essentially with that little rudder. In the same way the Queen Mary moves, we have that little rudder that helps us change our position in the force or field and go somewhere. If we were to do it any other way, right? we would have to come up with some source of energy, right, to sort of blast off like some spacecraft and and move. So I'm sorry now, folks, I'm probably going a little bit deeper than I wanted, but that's the point of this illustration is just to remind us all that we're all systems subject to forces and fields, and we're all sort of navigating. And so we're all sort of ruddering and trim tabbing ourselves and our organizations as we go. So it's not like an unusual thing. It's Bucky drew our attention to it, right? made us conscious of it. And by doing that, he made us uh, better able to do it, I think. Okay, well, looky there. Trim tab is a processional effect. I was channeling my inner genie. It was great. Uh, okay, so anyway, this is way too busy. And uh, I always promise to send this to people if they want, and they will. Uh, I've got my contact info. Uh, so I'm just gonna cover, uh, you know, it's just a way to remind me of things we're going to talk about. We already talked about what a trim tab is. Uh, how to find trim tabs. Uh, Bernard Gable, when I interviewed him about trim tabs, said, 
uh, trim tabs you find in the larger system. And then uh, another thing I ran into along the way is that trim tab in some ways is what the designers will call an affordance. That's a big fancy word. What it means is if we design something and we put a control on it, a way to adjust it, like the volume on a radio, that's an affordance. Uh, if we don't put a tuning knob on it, then we don't have an affordance. We can't really tune it. We're just sort of locked in. So then it's very easy to trim tab things that have these ways to access the properties of a system. If something is buried way inside of a system, then we can't get at it. It's very difficult to trim tab it, right? So we look for affordances. A related idea is that uh, just like designing for the future, we have our most impact in areas where we know the most or we're the best connected. And so therefore, if you're trim tabbing, you know, look for areas where you're involved in a system. You know the aspects of the system, right? Uh, you have some connections to it. It'll be difficult to trim tab something that you're not yourself enmeshed in, right? Because now you're trying to convince somebody else who may not know you, uh, who may not share your values, right? I mean, you can try and trim tab things by changing regulation, right? Uh, but Bucky, of course, would recommend, you know, we go the other way. So anyway, uh, another thing to mention is that we often think of trim tabs, like Bucky said, uh, the Queen Mary, a huge ocean liner, the big issues like uh, climate change or fossil fuel. And we can do that, but I think it can make it harder to be effective at trim tabs. Instead, we might say, well, you know what, that Queen Mary, it's actually, it's like 23 mid-sized boats and maybe they're oil companies or distributors or something else, or maybe it's, you know, bazillion little boats, which is all of us making decisions about cars and energy sources and things like that. So determining the level of scale, I think is important as we work through being a trim tab. Um, we talked about the idea that trim tab most commonly is re is viewed as a leverage, as a low pressure thing, but it can also be a phase thing. And uh, so an example is if you've ever heard the phrase top dead center, that means an internal combustion engine where everything is lined up at the top and it's really hard to get it to move just a little bit off that. Once you get it moved off it, all of a sudden you have enough leverage, you can easily make it go around. But top dead center is a, a tough point. In electrical design, there's a similar idea which is that uh, many of the components we want to use, like the big motors that are in uh, appliances, are very hard to get started because of the their electrical nature. And you can add a small component. Uh, some You may have heard motor start capacitor. And this small component changes the phase. And all of a sudden, we can more easily start the motor. So the phase works for us too, right? It works for us in terms of human systems and organizations and design processes. You probably know that if you try and change something in the middle of a big meeting and a review, rot's a ruck, right? But if you're able to talk to the people earlier on, right, uh, you would have a better chance of, of making the change. So phase is an important aspect of trim tabbing. Uh, it's incremental, generally speaking. Uh, as we said, with the airplane rudders, uh, it can be related to regulation as well as uh, as direction, if you will. Um, we'll get into some of this later on, but trim tabbing sometimes I think is telling a good story. If you want to change the direction of an oil company, you know, you're going to need somebody who works inside of it and, uh, they'll, I think in general need to sort of have a bigger picture, right. And for that bigger picture to work for them to make the connections that they may not be making, I think you essentially have to use a story that connects to them. And they can see that, you know, thinking of it in a different way uh, is better, you know, in whatever sense of it, et cetera. And so then I think story can be a very important way to trim tab other people and thereby trim tab bigger organizations. And let's see. I think that's plenty for now. <laughs> I'll go to the next one. Uh, oh, I see a chat. I'll just look quickly and see. Oh, okay. So Maurice has a great uh, example of a trim tab. Thanks, Maurice. Neutral angels in uh, Tom Robbins' book. So uh, if you want to trim tab a system, 
it's good to know a little bit about what goes on inside of it. Uh, and so there's a way to cope with an informal representation of a system uh, called rich picture. It's related to a method methodology that has been talked about, I'm sure in other meetups here uh, called system maps, but this is a very uh, casual way to make a, a system map. And so the idea is you get people involved with it and you have a big piece of paper and you just start drawing stuff in. This example is uh, Jenny the operator and things happening at work. And you start to put in other items in her workplace, other forces, other sources, uh, et cetera. And you also start to put in issues like, well, this is really a challenge. You really can't get this work done in the time given because of what, right? So rich picture is a way to have a shared understanding of a system uh, with somebody else and to do it in an informal way. Um, there, are, there are similar things to it. In some ways, systems mapping is similar. The point being, though, is that once you have it, you have this bigger picture of the system. And now you can say, aha, if I'm going to change the system for Jenny, look at all the spots I've got. You know, some of these could make a difference, right? And maybe it's a small change here. Maybe it's providing information over there. Maybe it's, you know, adding in a resource there. This is fairly well related <laughs> to uh, Danella Meadows' uh, 12 Places to Intervene in a System and System Archetypes. It's, you know, they aren't often connected, but I think it's the same, same idea is that once we have a system map and we see the interconnection and especially what these influences mean, now we can go in and look at it. So I think for this bigger level of change, it's really a good idea to create a systems map or a rich picture. A related idea is concept mapping. And this is a tool called CMAP Tools. And I did it because uh, there was interest in regenerative agriculture. And so everybody says, oh, I love it. You know, I really think it's something we've got to do. But guess what? We don't know any farmers <laughs> that we can go and change. And if we knew the farmer, then it's a question of could we actually get them to change? And so then I said, well, what's really happening at the household level? Well, there's one set of things happening here where we just go to the supermarket and buy food. And maybe it's based on what we used to buy or maybe it's based on ads or whatever else. And then there's another one where we could go to the farmer's market or we could directly connect up with a producer and what they call community supported agriculture, well, that's a whole nother system. But if you show these as both potential connections, <clears throat> now you can see where you could trim tab or influence one or the other, right? You could maybe turn one down or you could do it Bucky Hall's valving. You could like put in a different way of eating once a week or something like that. Okay. So now, um, I'm just going to kind of skip over this quickly. Um, essentially, if we're going to change the direction of the system, which I think in many ways has changed the behavior, we have to sort of divide up the idea that we have a goal. Like for a corporation, it might be something like, we'll make a certain amount of money and keep our employees, you know, in decent shape or something, right? A school might be to educate children and make sure they pass you know, certain things and keep them safe or whatever. So you got goals uh, and then you got this goal is over here, but you're here, you got to travel through there, right? And it's like sometimes through these gnarly valleys, so you've got the terrain. And so you need to kind of map the terrain. You have to have a sequence of actions, right? You know, so you have to continuously be looking and seeing what's happening and kind of know that the goal is out there and make decisions and where to go next. So it's one of these incremental things. And so then this is trim tabbing, right? Trim tabbing is one of these things where you're just continually making these small changes. And even though you believe the goal is always the same, your view of it probably changes. And uh, so, so just to say that there's some complexity in this whole thing. Uh, where are you? And this goes back to that earlier slide that really when we navigate, we're more or less interacting with other systems, right? big systems that we might be orbiting or influenced by or that have an ability to attract us, uh, et cetera. And so that's another thing to remember. And then uh, what are the pathways? There's many of these from relationships to exchanges. Uh, sometimes we can put force in, like when we get fossil fuel and run a car, there are similar things, right? Uh, so many things here, uh, we can trim tab by training ourselves or training somebody else, right? Uh, by being a leader, 
uh, by design. So the point is that there's many ways that we can change the pathway, that we can trim tab ourselves to kind of get where we want to go. And that there's actually a technical view of this, uh, which is, if you see at the top, you know, uh, essentially you can view any kind of a system that's complete as having some method of propulsion, some method of navigation, some method of control. And so these are all aspects that can be trim tabbed. So some complexity there, but, and then finally remember that your destinations could be physical, right? I need to get the other side of the pond. It could be uh, time-based, like at the end of the year, I wanna be X or B somewhere location. It could be a systems goal, like, well, I need to be involved in a different organization. I need to have a different kind of discussion group, et cetera. And then of course it could be a capability or a vision or a goal. Like I wanna have this community or relationship or you know, have this thing. So lots of stuff here, you guys. And this is where I want to pause and let you guys just think over some aspects of this and just get some discussion on uh, things you would like to trim tab. And so once again, oh, I think I didn't actually mention it, um, but I think it was in the description. Often if we want to trim tab ourselves, we start with small changes, right? Because guess what? It's easier to start with small changes. And if you read Atomic Habits or Tiny Habits, they'll say things like, you know, uh, put a piece of paper by your coffee cup. And if you want to do morning pages, write three sentences every morning. Uh, or if you want to do day planning, you know, spend, you know, two or three minutes before we go to bed doing day planning. Or in one of the books, they say, if you want to start running, you know, the first week you buy a pair of running shoes. Second week, you put them on. The third week, you walk around the block, right? The fourth week, you know, you walk a mile. Uh, and so the idea is that you kind of ease yourself into it as opposed to you get a pair of running shoes on, walk out the door and try and run five miles. And you go like, well, that's not going to work. I can never be a runner, right? So anyway, the tiny habit approach. So yeah, I just want to pause for uh, a somewhat an uncomfortable period of time, which is probably just going to be a couple minutes. And then people can put things in chat or raise your hand. And so we just want to share uh, some ideas of trim tab and then as a group kind of explore different ways to think about it and view it, if that's all right. So folks, uh, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat uh, or raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to share anything that you would like to trim tab. Uh, there are a lot of different things that actually uh, Kurt has put on the table, a lot of different domains of thinking. Uh, so there are a lot of different changes that would be uh, um, uh, that would be possible. Uh, I think one of the most interesting ones is the examples that you just provided with uh, small changes in our lives uh, that we can make. Uh, and that is actually supported by uh, 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 empirical evidence that uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy and rationally motor behavioral therapy to, to change a behavior, uh, a small change to your daily routine uh, could have uh, uh, huge impacts as to um, uh, whatever behavior you're, tr you're trying to overcome. Uh, you know, Kurt brought up a very good example with exercise, um, but it's not just exercise, but it's also the other changes that can occur, uh, maybe dietary or things along those lines. But there could be also changes to systems uh, as well. Uh, so we can think about it in terms of uh, um, economic systems. We can think about it in terms of uh, systems uh, uh, of architecture. Or so, if anybody has any ideas that they would like to share, uh, go ahead and uh, type exclamation point and uh, I'll see just Richard jump Brandon. in and just uh, shout out to Julie in the chat. She was saying, "Would starting something be an example of a phase?" Yes, I exactly right, Julie. I think. You know, once again, it's like, oh, oh, I got to start the big thing. But if you have that small little thing, right, a little bit of a different uh, approach, incremental or phase, that would do it. So that's a good one. So back to you, Joel. Sure. Uh, Richard, actually, and followed by Maurice. Well, I'm on. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. Uh, 
one of the things that I'm involved in, whether it's in sort of general counseling kind of work or in the specifics of what I've been doing in the area of suicide prevention, one of the things that has evolved over time is the idea of just being a listener, which may be just that, you just sit with somebody. Um, more recently, there's been an emphasis on hearing uh, somebody's story, allowing them to, to talk about why or what got them into the a place where they don't want to live anymore. Um, how would you put that in the context of a trim tab? It, it sounds like that little activity could be a trim tab and it, it flies in the face to some extent of the expert counselor who thinks they have to do a whole lot of other things, maybe big things in order to bring about the turning of the ship or turning of one's life to, to living. So is am I kind of on track in terms of what th those two examples might be considered trim tabs to bring out a bigger change in somebody's life? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, yeah, and, and fairly deep, I think. So, excuse me, you know, we talked about, you know, if we have this bigger system, it helps to have a map, you know, or in some cases a model. Well, I think uh, by having ourselves speak and, you know, without judgment, you know, without being worried about people judging what we're saying, it allows us to explore things, right? Until we put it in words, we never really explore anything. Uh, there's an, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this has actually happened, but when you're in a technical field and you really get stuck and you're just really having a hard time fixing a problem, it turns out if you actually go and try and explain it to somebody, you know, like 10 minutes into your explanation, you often go, oh, wait a minute, I understand it now. Uh, and in fact, I proposed at one point, you have a cardboard cutout in the corner of your cubicle. And if you didn't even really like to talk to people, you could just talk to this cardboard cutout. And the, by the time you talked your way through it, right? So just the idea of putting it in words allows the individual to get a better map or a model, right, of what they're doing. And I think would let them trim tab themselves. And then I also think it allows the other person, if they're really listening, like you're saying, heartfelt listening. And then in some cases, I've heard just echoing back what they heard. Um, that then gives that outside perspective, right? Which also would help them with that systems model and change. So I think those are great examples. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, that, that's really interesting in terms of uh, trying to create a trim tab uh, in one's role of being a helper and then following that through with the notion of opening it up so people can trim tab themselves. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that's I've, I've never kind of put it in that kind of the context. Thank you. Nice. That's a great example. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Maurice, uh, we have next, and then uh, we have a couple of comments in the chat that we can go over. Yeah, Kurt, I'm actually kind of working through this out loud because uh, listening to you speak made me realize about when, when I used to teach yoga. And, um, and inevitably, I mean, I would teach classes and people would show up and, and then inevitably I'd meet them down the line. And the first thing they would say, it's like, you know, I apologize. I haven't been doing my yoga. And then at some point I got to the point where I said, look, I didn't teach you to do yoga. I taught you how to breathe, <laughs> which in a yoga class, if you do it consciously, you would basically do at least 1500 breaths, conscious breaths. Breathing ujjayi, inhale, exhale, connecting to your body, and it's the breath. Yoga styles will change, but the breath remains constant. And um, and it's um, like like I said, I'm kind of just thinking this thinking this out loud and, and making it up as I go along. But but um, I, I I I guess what I'm saying is that what you. Uh, it, 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 Breathing is in a yoga class is the trim tab. Mm -hmm. It is the trim tab. Um, people think that they, because they learned in our yoga classes, an hour and a half yoga classes, that if they don't do an hour yoga 
or an hour and a half yoga, they haven't done anything. <laughs> when it comes right down to it, you can just do five minutes with the breath and you've done a practice. You've done a good practice. And that practice is the trim tab mm -hmm. moving you from one feeling space inevitably into a fuller space or a better feeling space. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, glad I'm here listening to you uh, spell this out. Yeah, another good example. Um, and I've heard the same with meditation, right? Oh, I could never do that. You know, I can't sit for half an hour at a time. Well, yeah, but after, you know, after morning coffee, you could probably sit for 60 seconds and then it might turn into a couple of minutes, right? And uh, and so then it, I think in the goal there is that our minds are just in this continual chatter mode. So we never really are even aware of, of what our self is doing or thinking or wanting. That's the same way I think with the morning pages, right? Just so much chatter. And so then just even a little bit of this, you know, calming less to, you know, see, oh, you know what? I really want to go outside at lunch. You know, that may be the thing underneath all the chatter we had or whatever, right? And so then, yeah, uh, by sort of being conscious of the breath or that minute of meditation, it may allow us to see the deeper, deeper stuff. And uh, Katie had put a thing in the chat and then it looks like uh, Jeannie. Uh, yeah, uh, Katie, um, so when we think of systems, we often think of physical stuff, right? And, uh, you know, but of course, we're systems as well, you know, uh, and composed of many, many subsystems, obviously. Uh, but a system can be a process, right? It can be a sequence of activities that you follow. And uh, it's good to, to develop those and test them out because we can tend to get better at what we do. We can see difficulties and challenges. We can fix them. And so, yes, I, if I understand your, your comment, then the idea of mapping relationships, that process could be a system. And if not, you know, put another chat in. But I think over to Jeannie, unless Joe has another idea. No, um, you know, I, I actually just uh, messaged and I, I think that, yeah, relationships can exist within systems. Oh, yeah. um, so, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, that's how we have to think about it. We're, we're mapping out. And I think a very good example of that is the, uh, uh, the uh, supply chain or going to the market uh, mm -hmm. example that you have uh, in the previous slide. So I think that that's, that was an excellent answer. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go to Jeannie, we actually have a, uh, somebody had messaged me uh, privately uh, feeling like I'm not living the life that fits me. I live a suburban corporate lifestyle right now, and I'm happiest in a nature loving eco village. Also, the overall search for community and relationships. Uh, you know, I uh, I don't know if you have any kind of thoughts on that, but I would imagine in the strategy section of your diagram, that would probably fit into that is to try and to figure out uh, uh, a way to, you know, kind of get into uh, um, a network of sorts that would allow you to kind of uh, uh, to, uh, live that life, live that transition to that type of life. Um, I don't know, have any, you know, immediate uh, suggestions, but Kurt, you may. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think a lot of us are really kind of disconnected from the current transactional, you know, like I tell people, you know, look around your room, everything that's in it is designed unless you have a, you know, a, like a house plant, right? Everything was, you know, dreamed up by somebody with, made of stuff extracted from the earth and put together and perhaps not even in a very good way, right? It's not going to last that long. And when it's, when you're done with it, you can't even actually recycle it, right? It's just like, it's insane, right? Then one of the things Bucky was emphasizing, of course, was to get away from that. So then, uh, you know, what he would say is, well, you have this vision. He would, you know, in his bigger process, he had called it anticipation in that later, uh, but our Gable, who worked a lot with Bucky, uh, called that, you know, a preferred future so that we come up with these preferred futures. And it's super important to do that. Often we just have these vague feelings. Oh, you know, I ought to be in this some other place and it can be almost mythical or utopic. But it's worthwhile to, you know, think, well, actually, you know, there is a place outside of town that looks interesting and I could learn more about it, you know, to make them a little more concrete. 
and then you know once we have that and of course that's like that goal thing right that you know this is what it looks like today but in a week it's going to look a little different because it'll have changed and will have changed and we're in a different position anyway once you have it then uh from a future standpoint you can uh, take small actions and uh, from a future standpoint what they say is you sort of ignore the negative trends because you can spend a lot of time right fighting the negative stuff and you could be somewhat effective or not effective and you could get pretty frustrated <laughs> um, but Bucky and I would say you concentrate on the positive stuff and reinforce it and so that might be tuning into solar punk or maybe there's a meetup or another organization where people talk about it or like I said you could visit a place and so like Joe was saying it's an incremental process. It's not an overnight process. Uh, Foundation for Intentional Communities is a great resource. FIC uh, is their shorthand, but they've got another website I just think is maybe ic.org or something. But anyway, Foundation for Intentional Communities, because they have a directory of all kinds of intentional communities. They're not all echo villages, but they're very interesting. Um, so, yes, and I think the more of us that can do that to start moving towards it, the better our society is going to be. So I just really encourage you to keep at it and to not be discouraged and to understand that it's just going to be, you know, a little bit of time. It may take, you know, not just a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It could take a couple of years that, that you'll get there. That's a great answer. So why don't we go to Jeannie? Let's see. Okay. Um. Well, at first I was going to say that I can't think of something, but I did want to bring up that I love the idea of using um, natural forces as your trim tab. You know, use the things that are already happening to trim tab situations. But then I did think of a very specific example, but it's not mine. It's really my friend. And um, she came up with the idea of helping the homeless by giving them yeah. all like a little calendar book where they can write down, you know, where their appointments are, what they have to do, when they go there, when they do this, and that this would help organize them because a big problem for mm -hmm. homeless people is, you know, mm -hmm. not having a house, of course, but not being able to organize their lives. And so this was her idea to get, I mean, what an inexpensive way to kind of get things started yeah in helping homeless so mm -hmm. i just wanted to put her idea out there mm -hmm. great thank you and then there was oh. a comment in chat from katie and i think it's really for richard uh, she was asking whether suicide uh, prevention is both actions and relationships and i want to defer to richard for that uh <clears throat> yeah well actually what that comment and uh what we were talking about relationships triggered in me the the importance of trying to bring the principles of tensegrity into this as well, so that uh, we're looking at things that could be changed, but also relationships or or a combination of both. Um, so yes, in that in that sense, uh, um, we may be trim tabbing to try and change the nature of a particular relationship. Or we may be trim tabbing to change the nature of the thing. Um, what I mean by that, if, if I'm juggling too many sort of things in my life, or um, I may feel overwhelmed. And so one of the guidance that some people are given is, uh, or at least asked to think about, is to um, put some of those aside, drop them, reduce the number of things. And in the integrity side of things then we see that there's that exponential kind of relationship between the number of things you're trying to deal with and the number of relationships that are being affected by that um and so it's it's good to be to look at both uh, and to have the context uh, that one's living in in order to help them do what in our work we've called a turning point which i think is it's kind of analogous to the idea of a trim tab actually um, getting a rudder to start to change in a direction that might be more um, uh, of, a, of a 
safer living approach to uh, one's difficulties than looking at it from the point of view, I better, you know, leave because I'm really not an advantage to anybody. And Fuller went through that himself, trying to put together the beauty of having a second child born in the same year that he had um, all kinds of uh, personal and business failures. And at one point, he thought that the world and family would be better off without him. And it'd be interesting to go back and, and work through what he did, because in a sense, I think he he trimmed he trimmed tabbed himself out of the intention to uh, just give up. I want to uh, go look. I, I'm going to uh, prompt <laughs> Richard, maybe. Uh, so one of the things, uh, Katie, as I understand it, and I'm going to do very poorly, but Richard can save me, is that he discovered early on that this simple model of a client and, you know, the counselor or the helper was not sufficient, right? But then when he mapped it uh, tetrahedrally, he added in relationships that then gave a much stronger uh, model and then with much better effects on uh, suicide, recovery from suicide. So help me out, Richard, maybe describe, because that's adding new relationships, right, is what your model did? Yeah, it added the relationships to the the things, and it allowed it to be uh, to be able to to model a sort of a minimum whole system. So it wasn't just the individual, but it was also the context that that individual was was in, whether it's their belief systems, the societal resources that they're connected to, like health, welfare, transportation, or the personal others that they have in their lives, whether it's fr family, friends, uh, associates, intimates. When you see that context, <clears throat> then you also see the pattern of relationships between them all. Um, and so you have a little bit more of a, uh, a picture, if you want, or the map, as you say, to know whether or not you should try and change your relationship, why you should try and change the things, or whether you try and change both. And certainly the notion of of the rudder that tries to change the whole system all at once is going to run into the the problem that the analogy of the rudder trying to change the Queen Mary. But if you've got a trim tab on the rudder, then you might be able to come up with something that that um, starts to turn the ship in terms of a, a more satisfactory or recovery way of living all right thank you that's great uh thanks for being so helpful and then uh julie uh was uh i was going to say echoing back but really it was kind of about echoing right julie that listening in the doctor's bedside manner which was not at one point seen as important at all and now it's important enough that it's a class and they teach uh, doctors, how important it is. Um, I uh, read an article about uh, somebody who had survived cancer and volunteered to go back to train doctors to do who are, have to deliver that diagnosis. And uh, the you know the doctors in training are just overwhelmed. They can't even think of how to do it. But yeah, by having people that are actual people who has and had some experience with it, it allows them to actually go through it and you know test it out so this whole idea of listening and uh, i'll call it echoing uh i think is super important and then i think it allows us uh uh to find the trim tabs to allow them to emerge i guess right something like that i think there's uh one example i'd like to offer really quickly if i may um you know that I think that there was uh, there is a lot of opportunities to use trim tabs within organizations, organizational dynamics, and make changes. And one that I'd personally witnessed is where uh, you know I worked in a what would have been a partnership. Uh, so it was it was a very big partnership. It was a very big accounting firm, 
Uh, but the partner would have, you know, there was a very, um, there were a lot of complaints about communication uh, with management in the firm. And so our one partner actually had had an open door policy every Friday morning uh, where you could walk in and have a conversation and whatever was on your mind that you could voice those, you know, your, your concerns and, and that they would be heard. And this uh, ended up being used throughout the entire organization itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was a form of creating kind of just that small open door policy turned mm -hmm. into something all the partners used, which also kind of eventually led to a complete reorganization on how they were actually structured. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and because they tried to create a more level organization where communication wasn't as big of an issue, but it started with the idea of just having an open door policy and then people starting to communicate with one another. And I think that that's a very good example of using already too, you're, you're using with an existing resource. You know, I mean, in a sense, you're not necessarily making this big change. You're just uh, you're just uh, maybe changing your behavior a little bit, but it changed the whole organization. And I think there are a lot of examples of that um, uh, throughout with, when you're making organizational changes that one small change can actually have a huge impact on a supply chain or, or throughout an organization itself. Um, so. Okay, and I think Julie uh, is going to she put an exclamation in. So she did. Oh, forgive me for not noticing that after your comment there, Julie. Go right ahead and unmute and um, share. Isn't, isn't life about trying to um, identify the correct variables that affect certain certain problems, and then trying to find the correct causal things for what works to eliminate the problem and isn't it all about just finding what works and what doesn't work and, and seeing it correctly, what is influencing in a good way and what's influencing in a bad way? Yeah, that sounds uh, good. And I'm sorry, I kind of missed the first part. I was yeah. capturing the previous one, but I'm reminded of a thing called appreciative inquiry. And yeah. I'll just talk about that a little bit as I understand it. And, you know, just have learned a little bit about it. So let's just say that there is an organization where the somebody came in and said, well, you know, you're doing really poorly uh, in terms of promoting women through the ranks. You know, you only have 20 percent of the leaders are women or something. And there is one uh, approach, which is, oh, we got to fix this. We have to do these, you know, like regulatory things that you've got to hire a certain number and you have to do all this. And often they don't work very well because they're sort of externally imposed and. Uh, then people react to the policy as opposed to the intent of it, et cetera. On the other hand, appreciative inquiry would say, well, that's interesting. And they would uh, have a process where they get people together and say, well, what's actually working right now? You know, what's actually working in terms of women? Is it, is it mentoring? Is it having somebody to talk to? Is it uh, flexibility, you know, in the, uh, the hours? You know, what are the things that are actually working? And so then with appreciative inquiry, and this is your, you know, finding what works, Julie, uh, it, there's been a lot of reports that this actually helps an organization more easily change towards what it means as opposed to this other sort of, I don't know, top-down or outside view. Is yeah, because it, we're looking for truth. And our world is based on a lot of erroneous um, paradigms, I guess, that are changing. I, you know, I think this might be a, an important point to come back to uh, because I, one of you know the things that I think about when I think about trim tab, and I think on a, on a much deeper issue, you're kind of getting to the metaphysical aspect of things a little bit, Julie, is the idea of knowledge and understanding itself. Uh, and once you understand the system, that you're able to know where what things will yield uh, a a high return when you make the change. But I, I, whenever I think of leverage, I think of knowledge is my first thing.
And I, I was just typing a note in response to Chad, you know, do organizations maintain the control by heading system components? That's a really interesting insight, Chad. And uh, yeah, I mean, so we know uh, there's a saying, you can only change the system with the boundary, but yet, you know, if you've ever tried to get through like a customer service, <laughs> right, to talk to an actual person about, you know, making corporate policy change, you're not, it's not gonna happen, right? And so corporations, I think, do at that level, really try and make it hard to get in. They just, they say, uh, you know, well, okay, let me back up. Um, there's a, a theory of, of, of modeling uh, systems, which says that in some cases, uh, new organizations are making sense of a chaotic situation. And so they're very flexible and they're, you know, really listening to the customers and really or potential customers, I guess, really learning what to do. And then as they go on, they say, well, okay, here's some offerings. Uh, so these are the things we're going to offer, but we're still listening because, you know, we're still pretty aware. But at, at a certain point, organizations get kind of locked in. Well, this is what we have. And this is the deal. We've made these decisions. And uh, if you have a problem, you know, we're going to give you a $10 coupon or whatever, but, you know, don't bother us again. So yes, in terms of, uh, uh, many organizations, I think they do make sort of a hard and fast boundary. And yeah, I think, uh, I mean, as having worked in corporations for most of my life, uh, for example, you know, well, why can't my raise be more fair? The manager says, well, it's policy. It's set at another level. It's set over in this other department, right? This thing's out of my control. And so then they'd make it look like it's really uh, fixed and inflexible. So it doesn't exactly address it, but I think that's a great insight, Chad. So Richard has the typed exclamation point in chat. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say I really like the analogy or the comparison between the notion of rudder changing and trim tab changing. And I think very often the way it was uh, presented was that one goes into almost in a sense training to become a specialized, a specialized person. Um, along the way that Bucky talked about specialization being a bit of a problem. Um, but it, we, we all think that if we study hard enough and learn all the technical skills, then we can make rudder changes. We can actually insert some kind of methodology. We can predict some kind of outcome. And that's what we strive to do. And yet, I think what we're talking about now is to move people off that rudder change sort of mentality and look for some of the trim tab opportunities that would bring about the rudder change at some point. So I think it's a beautiful comparison between trying to fix everything in, uh, in a rudder change way than trying to find little trim tab ways to begin to move the, the rudder and therefore the, the bigger ship. So thank you, That's I like like that kind of comparison, analogy yeah. comparison. And I see Jeannie has her uh, hand raised and Julie has another good comment too. So why don't we go with Jeannie and then we'll follow up with Julie. One of the one of the things I like about the idea of, you know, the trim tab on a boat and all is, you know, you think of the president standing up there in the front, you know, acting like he's leading us. And, you know, it, it, we can see that no matter what we're doing, it's not really working. <laughs> but, you know, if you're at the back of the boat, you know, you you can actually make a difference, even though, you know, you've got this, shall we say, clown up there in the front, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then Julie uh, mentioned feedback. And uh, so, yeah, is there anything else you want to say? I mean, um, no, it just seems that, it seems that um, for example, the best nursing home that I, we, we researched for my mom relied heavily on feedback. And they also were written up in Los Angeles as longest standing workers and residents because um, the feedback they did it every six months from the patients and everyone. Right. Uh, an example from organizational behavior and practice is quality systems. 
so I've been involved in organizations going through uh, putting in a quality system and uh, it's often really disliked, you know, by the employees when you put it in because it's a new set of ways to do things and accounting and et cetera. And, uh, but if you look at the philosophy behind it, uh, you know, the people that sort of manage it uh, and audit it, they don't say, well, this is the kind of quality system you need. They say to the company, well, what are you most interested in? What's important to you? You know, how do you measure it? How do you keep track of it? So they have the company actually come up with these methods of saying, well, we'd like to reduce scrap or we'd like to, you know, reduce errors in projects. Like, okay, well, so how are you going to do it? Are you going to have reporting? Are you going to have review processes? You know, and then the company themselves comes up with it. And so then sometimes the employees, it seems like, oh my, this is another thing to do. But generally speaking, it's going to improve things overall. I mean, it's not a panacea, but in general, it's going to you know improve what happens and reduce waste and et cetera. Um, but one of the things, the reason it came to mind, Julie, is that once you put it in and you actually start reporting how much scrap is going out the back of the factory, people are like, oh my God, that's terrible. How could it be that bad? And they're like, you know what? It's always been that bad. We've just never measured it. But now they're measuring it. We're aware of it. And now we actually know maybe it's even a resource and now we can deal with it. And I think it's the same way in societal issues. You know, we say, oh, there's all this abuse now. How could there be all this, you know, explosion of abuse? Actually, there's always been abuse. We just read uh, Huck Finn, <laughs> right, from the 19th century. It's, you know, his dad was abusing Huck in a, in a terrible way, right? And and Mark Twain was was talking about it back in, the, what, 1880 or something. So it's always been here, but, you know, all of a sudden we start to report it and we think it's terrible, but it's actually the first step towards fixing it. So, yes, I really like the feedback. Just really quickly, maybe, that, and that also relates kind of back to Chad's question. While organizations, in order to maintain control, hide things, sometimes within organizations, people hide things to maintain control. Uh, they, you know, there's little fiefdoms within and in, in the organization itself, and that is because it's perverted feedback. You don't necessarily, you, you don't have insight as to where maybe the bottleneck is in a particular operation. So mm -hmm. I think that that's, there's, you know, the, within the organization itself, and then obviously uh, the example that, that you provided as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we'll go back to the presentation briefly. Um, just going to have a couple other ways to, to think about this thing. Uh, but yeah, um, so, you know, modular design is often talked about and, um uh, it's done on uh, products. So for example, uh, if you uh, say, well, this component, let's say a stereo component has a power supply, you say, well, okay, that's a separate thing we can design. And then we can actually make improvements to the power supply later on and replace it. And we can do that without changing the whole you know, upper level thing. It's really good, right? And uh, you can do the same thing with all the other stuff, like, you know, the way the front panel, what we call the user interface and et cetera. So that's good. And then we apply it to our teams. And we say, well, uh, you know, we should have modular teams. You know, the power supply stuff, that's more of the electrical people. So we're just going to have electrical people working on it. And then the user interface, well, okay, we have to have some folks interested in users themselves, you know, the industrial designers, and then we have to have software people. And so then the teams have become modular. So one of the advantages of doing that from an organizational standpoint is that you keep that work sort of internal to the team, and then you decide what you're going to make visible, right? So the same way that the power supply doesn't expose everything about the power supply, it has the input and the output, you know, and it's got maybe some sensor information. Same thing with the power supply team. Right. So you meet with them periodically and you've given them a set of you know specifications and they tell you how close they are to it. So it's a very powerful way to develop stuff. And also then it's there's a powerful way to make changes going in the future. But just like Chad is saying and uh Joe was echoing, you can actually hide a bunch of stuff and then it becomes bad because it'd be like, oh, we actually didn't know there was all that stuff going on, right? At a systems level you might not know that all the stuff is going on in user interface that's really messing things up, but it's been hidden inside that, you know, modular thing. So it's one of those things that's got great advantages, but also has some challenges. So. Okay. Well, that's very useful. Excellent. Okay.
Does anybody else have anything that they would like to add? A lot of great ideas here. Well, we'll we'll give another chance here. So, um, so then, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, I spent uh, some time a couple of years ago making up these really simple cards. So, excuse my graphics, but I was like, so you know, as I was saying before, you know, you and I can't really swim up to the back of Queen Mary, you know. So, really, we're talking about well, who controls the rudder. Well, it's the pilot, but well, how does he get his directions? Well, he gets that from the navigator. Well, where does the navigator get his directions? Well, he gets that from the captain who gets it from the whoever, right? Um, and so then, you know, it's worthwhile to think about who we're influencing if we're going to try and change that direction via that. And so then it seems useful to use the metaphor of a lever. And I like to use this one that looks like a teeter-totter because we've all used that. And it turns out that for that lever to work, that pivot or that fulcrum needs to be much closer to the person or the system we're trying to change. So for example, if my neighbor doesn't share my politics, you know, I'm not going to be able from my side of that uh, pivot to be able to convince them, right? Because I don't have anything that's very close to him at all. And yet, if we could kind of go beyond it and say, well, actually, I'm not so worried about politics, I'm worried about my kids getting a decent education, so all of a sudden, you can move that pivot much closer to something you both share, right? You both want a decent education. You might differ on exactly how to deliver it, but you might have a lot of agreement about what, you know, the school should do. So it's important to, to just understand that even though we may really deeply feel we've got to fix something, the way we're going to be able to you know, tell a story and affect somebody is if we're working with issues that are, you know, they can sense that we have some buying or some involvement with it and they're much closer to what they themselves are doing so that's kind of the goal of this <clears throat> excuse me and then this is the same same thing just saying that and of course then we have to have a channel to do this right we have to have a way of sending a message right from one head basically to another and there's a lot of stuff uh, that we can learn from technical fields about this, right? So is that channel always open, right? Or what kind of a message should go across it? Is it a meme? Probably not that we'll use now. Uh, you know, as a regular check-in, oh, maybe that's actually pretty good. So anyway, it's important to think about the channel. And then uh, and a little bit more about then what the message itself might consist of, you know, but same, same ideas. And, uh, and then I did some stuff uh, before I actually went into it to uh, write like a short book on trim tabbing yourself and just said, well, maybe you should imagine yourself as a boat. Maybe that's one way to think about it. And so then uh, remember we talked about systems being in fields and forces that are going to move us along. Like, you know, sort of, you know, time chases on, <laughs> you know, Monday morning is going to come around. Many of us have to go off to a job. You know, and there's a lot of forces there, right? I mean, we do it. We have a more or less contractual relationship to show up and produce certain stuff and get money for it. And so that's certainly driving us along, as well as other things that I sometimes visualize as maybe winds coming across it, which might be our desire to do something different or to spend more time with the partner or do whatever else. So then uh, we have the flow, if you will, of whatever we're in and like the queen mary right whatever that is and then we have the other forces that we can catch with this with the sails like Jeannie was saying she liked that natural forces thing and then we actually have a big one and we have a little one right and we can change and and we don't always follow a given direction right we kind of zigzag sometimes to get where we want to go and then finally we've got the rudder and then oh and on top of that we've got ourselves kind of as the pilot of the boat and so it can be advantageous to just spend a little bit of time managing ourselves, right, as having all these components who are trying to trim our ourselves, or obviously our organizations that, you know, all these pieces, um, <laughs> excuse me, can make sense of it. So this then is a simple visualization, visualization of the fact that, you know, there's different kinds of forces. And uh, sometimes we actually can produce some internal energy to move forwards, but more often we're subject to all this external stuff around us and we can both use the rudder and use the trim tab and then just sort of taking it apart. So this is sort of the same as I started with, but just being a little more graphic about it. Oh, and then don't, don't forget the keel. 
So that's a big thing that sticks down in the middle of the boat and keeps us stable. And we all have keels, right? Like wisdom of the, our ancestors is a keel. You know, having an ethical system is a keel. Uh, you know, however you want to characterize that. Um, so those things are all there and are all part of it. <laughs> and then even, you know, just encouraging people to make their own really rough sketches, right? Um, and then... I guess just one, I think this is the last uh, big idea to put in. So <laughs> Bucky uh, said that there's a system component that's called a valve. And what it does is it either lets a little bit in or it lets a lot in. And you know how this works, right? You have knobs on your faucets. But it turns out valves are used throughout all of design and engineering. In fact, back when before transistors, we had tubes and tubes were known as valves to the British. And they were known as valves because you'd use a small control voltage to, to control the much larger voltage. And that's how you got an audio amplifier. That if you remember uh, LP records, there's a little tiny signal, right, coming off of that, uh, what do they call it, the cartridge. And then essentially it goes through a series of valves, tubes or transistors or whatever, to basically use that small control signal to control a much larger signal and make the sound very loud. So, so we have these two. And then you can use valves to produce uh, variations in frequency. And that's a whole nother discussion with Bucky, right? Where we're surrounded by systems that are bigger and slower than us. And we have a lot of systems within us that are smaller and faster. And so then the smaller and faster mm -hmm. ones are higher frequency and the bigger ones around us are lower frequency, right? Like the, mostly the, well, the seasons affect us, but not so much on a day-to-day -day basis, except when there's a big storm. Uh, and then the beating of our heart doesn't typically affect us unless we have a problem with it, right? Um, so anyway, uh, this is all related to valving, what we call modulation. And uh, so it's just an idea to just let sit in the back of your head that we're doing this all the time in terms of you know, how we communicate pe with people. And we're also doing it with how we decode what's coming into us, right? And that's what Buggy said, what he called tuning in. And uh, as Amy Edmondson said in a fuller explanation, you walk in the room and you say, well, what do I see? And you might concentrate on the chair. And when you see the chair, then you kind of know there's a table there, but you're not paying attention to it. Or maybe there's a stove, you're not paying attention to that because you're looking at the chair, you're tuned into the chair, you see the chairness. Or you could say, oh, and there's a book on the chair. At this point, you're aware of the chair, but it's not what you're concentrating on. And so Bucky said, it's important to sort of be aware of when we tune into the system. And we're like, okay, that's where I'm working. We're working on the chair. But simultaneously, and this is the comprehensivity he always talked about, simultaneously by being aware of the chair, we're aware of the smaller and faster stuff and the bigger and slower stuff. Like, for example, what happens to the chair when it breaks, right? Can we fix it? How can we get rid of it, et cetera? So anyway, this is a little bit off topic, but I wanted to throw it in. So that's what I had for tonight, I think. Well, welcome to have more discussion than any of this. So folks, uh, you have any questions or comments that you wish to share about this evening's presentation, uh, please feel free to type exclamation point in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. And uh, go ahead and free, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, Richard. Sorry about that. <laughs> had to break corn for supper. Uh, I, I just wanted to come back to what Kurt was saying uh, around the the concept of the zigzag uh, in terms of the boat moving. And, and I think it's, uh, in a sense, we sometimes, we skip over that uh, kind of notion of zigzagging. And so and also in, in, in boat movement, we might call it tacking. Uh, in skiing, we'd call it traversing. Um, trying to move a fridge uh, from one side of the kitchen to another, we might call it zigzagging. <laughs> so the whole point, though, is, is that the leverage that you're talking about in terms of having the fulcrum close to the, to the object you're trying to change, 
uh, is certainly very important. And I think the the zigzag is 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 very important as well to get that kind of motion going that will actually move things um, more effectively than trying to get in front of it and pull it towards uh, some destination or behind it and push it. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight the importance of the zigzag tacking, traversing in that boat metaphor that you were talking about that we could create for ourselves. So thank you. Kurt, do you have any uh, comment or? Uh, I think that's wonderful. And I was I just distracted because I was going to capture it in the PowerPoint, the zigzagging. So thanks, Richard. Yeah, I think that is an excellent example as well. Uh, Chini, you have your hand up. Um, I like the zigzagging too. And just sort of as an example, um, is people, you know, if you're like, I don't know, protesting or trying to get some message out there, they get immune after a while, you know, so, you know, to stand outside and always, you know, have your sign, the same sign, people will ignore you eventually, you know, but if you every now and then do something different, then you get a little bit more attention from people, I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, a long while ago, I read a book by, I think, Carl Albrecht, and uh, it was kind of a pop. Uh, I mean, it was sort of self-help, but it had a bit of a basis to it. Anyway, one of the things he said is that your your point of view, right, determines the structure, order, and relation to the system. And it really struck me that if I'm working in the factory in the third shift, how do I view the factory? Okay. I got my work and I got my buddies or not buddies, right? You know, et cetera. That's, that's one view. Now we go up to the level of somebody, maybe the factory foreman managing all the flow and all the stuff at hundred employees, very different view of it. And then you finally get to the owner who might view it as, well, I got that big bunch of stuff over there and I got somebody managing it. And uh, I'm more concerned about what I get out of it. And then you've got the, cons the consumer who is like, Oh, I really like this, uh, but it broke or whatever, right? And so then I'm not saying that the factory changed, right? But the point of view of that third shift worker and the maintenance, for example, on the machine that's not doing its correct job is not visible whatsoever to obviously to the external uh to external people. And maybe it's not the best example, but you get what I'm saying, right? Is that as you change your point of view you see the system differently. There's no way you can actually comprehend because systems are these really complicated. I like to use this thing of, you know, David Kosky does these uh, irregular tetrahedra that are related by the, the phi factor. <clears throat> and it's a little hard to see in this one, but if you put them together, they actually spiral together like they look like something that was growing outside. And uh, so the systems are all like this. And so you can imagine if there's like a bazillion other pieces to it. Yeah, you couldn't see this from any one point of view and really get it. So yeah, good one. Uh, if I can just build on that really quickly, because I, I happened to have a very interesting conversation just two weeks ago with someone about this, about uh, she spoke about how her brother had started on the on the floor of a manufacturing facility. Uh, went to the management level, did worked at various levels within the company and had different points of view. And I think that this is really important because you have to understand the system in order to actually make a change that's going to have a high impact. And that is basically what you're able to do is you're making the connection between the nodes that you talked about a little bit earlier. And what you're seeing is what would Bucky would call it, I believe, leaky corners. So where these things come together uh, and you can make little changes that have big impacts, but you need the different perspectives in you know, being on the floor. Uh, and Home Depot actually has a program where that you actually work on the floor and that before you actually gradually make your way through management. Um, but again, it's about having different perspectives and understanding the operations so that you can actually make the connections that act that allow you to to uh, um, 
uh, to uh, you know have a big, make a big impact uh, with a, maybe a small change. So I think that that's an excellent example. So next up, we have Julie. Yeah, I was going to say somewhere in this maybe a, a reason why people uh, companies have missive statements to get every because it seems like if the same goal was shared by all the different parts, then it would work better. And then someone in there doing research to find out from all those different perspectives what the goal is and, and um, the mor for the morale. Communication is a big part. Yeah, I was also going to say some of these um, systems or ideas, um, yeah, you can look at things that work and, and borrow them to support your next um, thing you're incorporating. Um, but what is, some of the greatest um, things come from like out of the box, ideas that aren't just regurgitated, but they come from inspiration or something like that. I mean, I, I don't know if all the the people we read about, they were new novel, original thinkers of some type, usually. Yeah, um, you're right. So we spent the night discussing this incremental change. And, and I was going to mention at some point that this Kaizen, if you ever read about Kaizen, the idea of continual improvement from Japanese production systems, you know, same, same thing, right? Just if you improve by 1% a year, it may not seem like much, but in a few years, it's going to be a big, big deal. But it, you know, once again, that was only one of Bucky's, uh, maybe it's most well-known trim tab. Uh, but, you know, the other ideas of creating a new model or using precession systems coupling, I think are more towards what you're talking about, Julie. You know, like uh, the famous Henry Ford's, if I would ask people what they wanted, he said a faster horse, but they would have wanted a horse that didn't poop, right? Because the biggest issue was there was horses pooping all over the streets. It was a, just a disaster. They had no idea what to do with it. In a way, a car was that, right? It just pooped into the sky and it was invisible. That was another issue. But uh, anyway, uh, yes, good one. So next up, we have Maurice. Yeah, Kurt, Kurt you were you were talking about the factory and it made me think of something that happened today at the farmer's market. So I was raised on a dairy farm. So I know how farms work. I know what the distribution systems are like national. And I also know what's required for a small farm, this system for, for a small farm to work in a farmer's market. And it was interesting. One of the women said today, you know, we had, we had a, a meat procurer, who I know and I actually worked for. And she said, it's like, you know, I had found out that, that, you know, for a period of time, they had to freeze their chickens. They had to kill the chickens and freeze them. So they weren't fresh. And, you know, and then I, you know, I got some of the chickens and they were bad. And she goes, you know, that's, that's not, that's not farm to table. And I'm listening to this the whole time. And it's just like, one, you need to understand, you have to understand that what farm life is like. This probably was a necessary adaptation in order for that farm to stay in business. And you kind of have to roll with the system and understand it in order to the fact that it's like your meat's not going to be perfect 100% of the time, which is what you could find in a store. But at the same time, you're supporting a corporation and blah, 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 and, and all of that. Um Anyway, um, I, I think I think what I'm trying to say is it's it would be very helpful if people really, really understood the, the, the nature of the system. And then the nature, I, I guess I want to say of the anomalies that may happen, that everybody that's a part of the system has to gently adapt to temporarily in order for everything to work. Yeah, it, you know, it seems like you know, from the discussion, uh, we're really, you know, kind of uh, emphasizing this understanding, or at least to having something, some way to think and look at it, right? And then try something. I didn't talk about tinkering. And so tinkering is an idea that in some cases, it's been suggested, it's really, you know, Darwinian evolution, maybe tinkering, right? You make these small changes and see what happens. And then people tinker. But the idea is that you don't know exactly how to fix something, but you you know, use what's at hand and you make an experiment and see where you go with it. And so 
uh, it could be that if we were to come up with a trim tab process, you know, it might be, you know, to create some kind of a model, talk to other people about it, you know, start tinkering and see if what you're doing seems to have an effect, right? There could be something more like that. So it's very interesting. You know, one question maybe I, I would like to pose is even how to find a trim tab to begin with. And I think that you had that on the diagram. And I think that this is a really important point when we're thinking about it in general. Um, and one of the one of the options you had was mapping uh, out the process itself. Uh, but another very important point is understanding the scale. Uh, in the scalability of the change that you're actually making. Like, so in other words, uh, uh, the impact. Uh, so my friend actually has something where he has um, the the uh, scales of measure and then basically there's an impact estimation table and they actually measure the impact of the changes themselves and say, you know, and that's how they prioritize. Uh, if you think about it in terms, of if you were automating a business process, which ones are you going to automate? You're going to automate ones that, have the least level of effort and highest uh, highest impact. So I think that that's actually uh, one of those areas that I think is when we're talking about trim tabs and maybe we could talk a little bit about that, uh, spend some time talking about that because I think that that's an important concept as to how do we go about actually identifying trim tabs. Uh, you know, and I, you, you had some nice, uh, you know, uh, uh, examples in the model and uh, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you may be remembering that I made this really simple, you know, so concept mapping, just, you know, FYI, the, the advantage of using a concept mapping tool is every time you connect two things, a question mark appears on that line and it says, tell me what this line means, you know, define your relations. And this is very Bucky, right? He said that the system is actually defined by the relations or the edges. It's not just, it's not defined by the nodes. We typically think of it, you know, like the hard things at the corner, right? Or what determinant. But he said, no, it's actually these edges. They're dynamic. They're forces and fields. And so, uh, you know, coming up with what those are, you know, by creating a model, if you use concept mapping, like I said, you're forced to at least identify what that, what that edge, if you will, might be. And then in the very simple one I built, you know, it, sim it had that one sort of, supermarket loop that we all do right and then the other one which has advantages you know like marisa saying local food uh but then other things that people may not like as much like if you sign up for what they call community support agri agriculture and get a box of stuff it's not like you can tell them what to put in the box i mean you get what the farm grew that week right and which is a wonderful thing and it's fresh and it's you know it it forces you to think of new things but it's a really different way to do it and so this, you know, goes back to Joe's point of sort of understanding what these pieces are, then you could say, well, you know, how would I then try and change the system if I want to change and make, you know, a more regenerative ag system, you know, what would I do? I'll tell you that many people are saying, well, you actually have to go be on the supermarket to the farmer, right? And then you have to have to work with the forces that are there for the farmer. But guess what? Super constrained by governmental policy. For example, a best practice in agriculture means you may not be able to do certain things that are uh, considered regenerative because then all of a sudden you lose your crop insurance. And so then there's people who work at that level. And so, so yeah, um, yeah, I think that's one of the big findings out of that whole idea of trim tab is a model, but a shared model, because, you know, somebody else, right? Jeannie is looking at it, you know, and Richard's looking at it and saying, well, Kurt, we need to add this, we need to add that. Now you have a chance, right? And then I think you have to experiment. You can't just assume, oh, I'm going to go change that relation. I'm going to valve it or, you know, you know, put another one in or something and assume you know it. I mean, uh, there are people who believe they can do that and make, you know, that they have a model and a computer and they can change it and test it. And that's really worthwhile. I'm not criticizing it, but it's, you know, the, the ability to predict what happens is, I think, not super high. But anyway, yes, that's a great point, Joe. Yeah, I think that's you know sometimes, it, and it can happen organically too. So an example would be I also uh, 
had read about where there was a uh, um, a community that was economically uh, depressed uh, that created community gardens uh, and that these community gardens actually ended up turning into co-ops co uh, so that they actually you know started to provide the become self-sustaining in its own right uh, so that's something where there's just an experiment uh, that actually occurs. And it is a trend of it's a minor impact that you have on the community, but uh, nonetheless, it, it has a way of actually becoming something much bigger uh, and self-sustaining. Yeah. Uh, so Carol Sanford has written books on regenerative design. She was a guest at one of the, I forget if it was design science studio or if it was the space camp. Um, but she was saying that one of the biggest things you can do for regenerative design is adding nodes to a system. And a node, for example, might be uh, a farmer's market because all of a sudden it's not a one-time thing of linking you up to a farm, but it's a way for the farmers at any given year to show up, right? And uh, and then, but you know, you don't actually have to know who those farmers are and then consumers once again, but you don't have to know who those are. You just have that hub or node she thought that was a good example of a trim tab. And that echoes what you're saying. To me, I think at that point, you've kind of gone beyond trim tabbing. But I do think that mm -hmm. what you're saying, Joe, is exactly correct, that you start with that smaller thing, right, of just a community garden. And then you'll find out it changes individual's relationship to the food. The city becomes aware of this. People drive by and they really like it. Right? You know, they see public gardens and, you know, in their neighborhood. It has many, many positive effects. So... Yeah, it's good stuff. I mean, I, towards me running out of steam, I noticed Will turned on his camera for a minute and I thought he was going to say something, but he must have had to step away. Uh, but yeah, is there anybody else, especially somebody who hasn't? Oh, I like Emily's. Well, I, I'll just dance with Emily's uh, idea for a second as I kind of uh, tiptoe off the side. Um, so uh, I occasionally get to these uh, NASA presentations uh, about what's called convergent aeronautics and basically how NASA could use some ideas from aeronautics to make the world a better place for people. And so somebody's talking about uh, second and third level futures. And so the idea was, so you have something that's happening and you say, well, what's the impact of that trend going to be? And the example was robotic cars. You know, well, what happens if you actually get robotic cars? Well, that's really cool. Uh, well, they're probably electric, so the pollution goes down. Okay, you're and uh, you're probably not going to have very many repair stations because, once again, there's much less maintenance. Oh, and then probably you won't have as many car companies because it'll turn out that there's, you know, just a couple, three that make all these cars and people won't probably have as many of their own cars. So that's going to change that whole thing. And then service stations, well, you get a reduction in the people doing service stations and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get along to say, well, and then there's going to be a bunch less accidents because, you know, the they're not going to be inebriated, the robots, right? <laughs> not going to do dumb things, et cetera. Um, and then so you're now, you know, sort of at one and a half levels or something. And they say, oh, but actually what that means is you're going to have a lot less organ donors, because most organ donors came from car crashes. And if you reduce the amount of, <laughs> of car crashes, all of a sudden you're not gonna have organs to help these people that really need a kidney or whatever. And they're saying, so you should, you know, when you're looking at a future thing, always think out a couple of levels just to see what might happen with it. So that's almost off topic, but uh, I thought it was interesting with respect to what Emily was saying about, oh, all the compost we lost when we went from horses to cars, right? <laughs> it's a good one. If there are any other uh, comments or questions, um, you know, now's the time to ask. Uh, you know, I think that this has really been a lot of fun. I mean, one of the most important points uh, it, it also when I think of trim tab is just energy in general, understanding how energy flows uh, within a system, um, because then it's just a redirection of the energy so that essentially you start to be able to have uh, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you're using already what's existing and you're just kind of redirecting it in a, in a, in a, in a way that benefits more people. Um, and, uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's an important concept to have 
precisely for the reason that you mentioned earlier in the presentation uh, is that, you know, how are you going to convince maybe, um, you know, energy companies that are currently polluting the environment to move away from those practices? Uh, and that goes back to the idea of having a story, you know, uh, and, right. and, and being able to at least connect on that level and to get people to, to then, you know, make a minor change in behavior that hopefully has, you know, uh, long term and 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 a, a big impact. So I think understanding the how energy flows, perhaps one of those goes back to the idea of knowledge, but it also to, I think it's the most important thing about trim tabs when I think about it. Yeah, so that's, dang it, Joe, you gave me another good question. I was trying to sneak out. Um, so yeah, that, uh, Medard Gable said that was one of the most important things Bucky taught him was the energy metabolics. What's happening? Where is it flowing? What's it doing? And this directly uh, comes from natural systems. So there was a mystery for forever as to how, you know, laws of physics says everything runs down and yet there's all this complexity in the natural world, right? There's all these species and the, you know, these climax ecosystems and we're pretty complicated. And how did that happen? And so this guy, Ilya Prigogine, developed a theory. He was a thermodynamicist and he won the Nobel Prize for it. So it's the real deal. And he called it dissipative systems. And he said, well, what's happening is, you know, with this tinkering, right, you're making small changes. If you make a small change and you get better at capturing energy or storing energy, then you're going to do better than your buddy next door. Like if I do a better job at chopping wood and it's a longer winter, I'm more likely to survive and reproduce than Fred across the street, right? So, and so then it's these little small changes that incrementally add up, right? That wind up producing the kind of complexity that say, oh, mitochondria are a clever deal. Guess what? We got the DNA for that. Let's just keep that. And then let's see what else we do with it. So then that's the same, same thing, right? So life does that. Uh, along the way, it's what Gene Benya says is life creates conditions conducive to life. You know, what works such that the byproducts actually aid more stuff like Emily's compost or, you know, whatever we're talking about, that the decay of, you know, all the extra cherries, you know, actually benefits the earth and uh, other creatures and things like that. So yes, the energy flow is super important. And uh, you could use that as your metaphor. Uh, there's people who developed all theories of modeling and everything. So, um, yeah, it's that's very important. So, folks, uh, all right, I guess chance. I, yeah, we'll plan to be next month back if that works out, and we might do precession on the list of systems change things just because it seems of interest you know you guys respond and you have ideas and all that so um so, but thank you all but thank you kirk uh i mean uh, these these uh monthly meetings have been uh you know have been a real treat uh for us as a community and um uh for those who view the film afterwards and uh actually for uh making Bucky's idea was really accessible, uh, and uh, and I can't thank you enough. I, I, every one of these presentations, I walk away with something new. Uh, I'm still thinking about last month's systems within systems. Uh, you know that question in particular has really kind of set me down a, a rabbit hole. So I'm I'm really uh, you know I'm enjoying these, and I know that I've spoken to other people that feel the same way, and. Um, all I can say is thank you, and we're grateful. Uh, so, uh, with okay, that, I'll just I remembered that I actually did a very it's too complicated thing on trim tab theory where I did something like this, but in like 17 minutes and put it up uh, on oh. YouTube, and it's linked on systemeducation.com, my website. And I've got I don't know six or eight like basic Bucky videos where I tried to make it really short up there. And so, if you really want to obsess more about trim tabs you could also go look at that uh and then let me know what you think so <laughs> but yeah. also appreciate the accessibility afterwards too it's also yeah. in the chat yeah so yeah. I, I encourage everybody to to check that out take care thank you kurt take care um yeah. i'll just thank you kurt uh, I'll just do some quick announcements uh, for upcoming uh, meetups this week with 52 Living Ideas. 
uh, on Tuesday, we will be reading the Analix, uh Confucius. We'll be doing the second half of chapter 13. Uh, on Wednesday, we will have our comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is done in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society, and that will be a uh, led by Sanjay, uh, and it will be a topic on neuroscience. And on Thursday, we'll continue our uh, series on Aristotle's uh, uh, poetics, and I think we'll be focusing on aesthetics this week. Um, so uh, that'll be on Thursday, and I believe um, we are covering a play this Friday, uh, and if I remember correctly, it's Oedipus Rex, and I can let you know for certain. Um, in a moment. Yes, it is. By Sophocles. So uh, that is on Friday. Um, and then just as a side announcement, it's important to uh, uh, remember uh, Asian philosophies, which had taken a month off, they have they cross post with us, Jason Pang, who's good enough to spend Tuesday nights with us, uh, translating Confucius, the Tao, Art of War, he's been a uh, uh, extremely generous with his time. Um, but his Asian philosophies uh, meet up, uh, which happens at Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, two o'clock uh, uh, West Coast. Um, and this week, I it's a, it's returning. I believe it, it has to do with Taoism this week. It's it's not uh, on our website, but I, I, I do believe it has to do with the Tao. So, um, I encourage you, uh, encourage everyone to uh, take a look at that as well. So uh, with that, I appreciate, again, everybody coming this evening. And uh, it's wonderful. Great questions, great conversation. And we'll see everybody soon.